Uh, first, just a few small housekeeping items. Uh, there are two lists here, um, one for the uh, punting trip and one for the conference dinner, where if you have signed up for any of those, maybe if you could please at some point check that your name is really there uh, and let either me or, or Vicky know in, in case uh, you should somehow slip through the cracks. And there is also uh, some information here about um, how to connect to the wireless in, in this building. That might be of relevance to a few of you. Um, so let me uh, uh, just say a couple of words about the Future of Humanity Institute that is the organizer of this conference. We are part of the uh, um, James Martin 21st Century School, which was created here uh, at Oxford some uh, two or three years ago now, uh, thanks to General's benefaction. Uh, we are one of uh, currently uh, 10, but soon to be expanded to some 15 or 16 different institutes within this school. Uh, we're also uh, part of the Faculty of Philosophy and uh, our mission is uh, to bring excellent scholarship to bear on big picture questions for humanity. Um, it seems a pity that while there is a, a large amount of research focused on a huge range of different particular questions around the world, um, the very biggest questions, the ones that perhaps arguably matter more than uh, most other things, such as will human beings survive this century, will we use technology to radically transform ourselves, things that could fundamentally change the human condition, have so far mainly been um, relegated to the odd speculation by some journalist or some retired physicist or somebody who is not, uh, whose, uh, whose day job uh, is something else. Um, and so, so we are trying to change that by uh, making it possible to to think more analytically and rationally about some of these really big picture questions. And this, this conference is a one little small element in, in that <coughs> broader effort, um, focusing here on our second current main work area, which is global catastrophic risks. Um, we're also doing some work on um, human enhancement, ethics um, and techniques, uh, issues surrounding the possibility of using future or present technologies to enhance human capacities or modify human nature in different ways and the various uh, troublesome questions that raises. And then methodology and rationality uh, involved in uh, forecasting potential future developments, biases, um, probability theory relevant to this, and finally anticipated future technologies, um, their implications and impacts. So what I thought I would um, just spend five minutes doing is very quickly go through uh, a few different terms and concepts and ideas just because um, we are coming from many different uh, specialties to this conference and maybe to make it easier to, to communicate and to make sure that there's some common language at the bottom of it. It might be useful just to introduce a few simple things that might be very familiar to most of you or superficial. So I already had yesterday on this slide where uh, uh, I gave the definition of an existential risk which is one that threatens to uh, cause the extinction of earth originating intelligent life or to permanently and drastically reduce its potential for further development. And the global catastrophic risk, which uh, is a wider category, uh, vaguely a risk that has the potential to inflict serious damage to human well-being on a global scale. Um, so all existential risks are global catastrophic risks, but not vice versa. Um, and we can distinguish uh, a scope the, the size of the population that is uh, imperiled from intensity, how severe each individual in the population would be affected. And now we can make a distinction between exogenous and endogenous risks, where the exogenous ones would be ones that do not originate from human activity, although it might be possible for humans to mitigate them. Um, so an asteroid impact would be a clear example of that. Um, and the endogenous risks are all the rest. Um, it's also tempting in some cases to uh, try a classification on the basis of um, what role human intentions play in making a disaster happen. Um, and sometimes this is useful and sometimes it's not very applicable. We could distinguish between accidental and deliberate, um, but in many cases um, the line uh, is blurry between these two different categories. So if you think of, um, say, 
uh, Cold War situation where you have a lot of nuclear weapons on hair trigger alert on both sides, you can envisage a scenario in which some sufficiently high placed decision maker um, goes mad and decides to launch an attack. In one sense, this would be a deliberate accident because he deliberately decided to launch an attack. But in another sense, it would be an accidental disaster because the system was not built, uh, and did not intend to launch an attack. And it was an accident uh, in this wider perspective that, that this general should go mad and launch the attack. Or we might place it in a third category um, of systemic causes, which might be the fact that you have different states that compete in power and you have nuclear weapons available that leads to arms races. And from that point of view, the, uh, the disaster might have come about through the systemic conditions of uh, interacting uh, intentions by many different agents that eventually made the outcome likely. And we can also distinguish between um, proximate and distal causes. So the pr proximate cause would be the general pushing the button. The distal cause might be um, some facts about the geopolitical situation. And you can trace it back even further to distal cause might be human nature, the way we have evolved to be in human psychology. And um, whether something is accidental, deliberate, or systemic might depend just on how far back in the causal chain you're looking. So in my example, um, it would be deliberate if you just look at the proximate cause of the general. Accidental if you look um, a bit earlier. Systemic if you think of the whole system. And maybe accidental again if you go all the way back to um, the processes that created uh, our planet and the preconditions for human evolution way back then. Um, another sort of useful distinction to, to have available is uh, between different concepts of probability. And there are many of them. Um, but broadly speaking, it's useful to distinguish two categories. Uh, on the one hand, objective chance, and on the other, epistemic probability. And there are each of these concepts is, is problematic and there is a big literature on each one of these. Um, but if you have a pair of dice, it's natural to say that there is an objective probability uh, of obtaining a particular outcome. Um, if you have uh, an unbiased die, it would be one six to get the particular side up. And if you have a biased die, that would be a different objective outcome. Say the dice have been loaded you might have objectively a one in three chance of getting uh, a six. But the epistemic probability that some agent would assign to this outcome, if knowledgeable about the things that you could reasonably be expected to know about these dice, might still be one six. So there can be situations where it's rational to assign a one six probability to a certain outcome, even though objectively the chance is something different. So with a loaded die, if you don't know which way the die are loaded, uh, you might assign an even probability to the different outcomes. So some people could argue that objective chance only really exists if you go down to the level of statistical mechanics or even down to the level of quantum physics. Um, and even if that is so, however, there is a, a role for a useful concept of sort of quasi-objective probability, which at least would apply in terms of gambling devices and, and might apply more generally. Epistemic probability, um, by that I shall mean sort of our best subjective estimate of how likely it is, given our available information. And, and of course you could explicate that in many different ways, uh, um, depending on who we have this information and, and what kind of idealizing assumptions you make about our computational powers and so forth. But nevertheless, it is um, a, an important distinction to have in mind because there can be risks where uh, we are pretty sure that objectively there is no risk, zero probability. So one example might be uh, the nuclear physics experiments, um, the new particle collider at CERN, where basically everybody agree that the most likely uh, situation is that there is zero objective chance of anything going wrong. But the whole debate is whether epistemically there is a significant chance because our understanding, our prediction that there's a zero objective chance could be wrong. And so that's the question. We can perhaps loosely uh, identify a spectrum ranging from more scientific uh, risks to more speculative ones. Um, 
where by scientific I would mean ones that are more tractable to um, rigorous um, quantified analysis. And speculative ones being ones where people's opinion, even experts' opinion, will be more dependent on subjective judgment and analogies and informal reasoning. So asteroids would be a clear example of a scientific risk in, in this terminology. Um, there's good statistics on that and you can clearly study the asteroid threat fruitfully by applying standard scientific methods. Whereas at the other end um, of this spectrum, if you're worried about, say, the future prospect of artificial intelligence, it's much harder to apply the standard generally understood and accepted scientific methods to achieve anything approaching a consensus. And if you go to alien invasion or simulation shutdown, the, the risk that we are living in a computer simulation that suddenly gets shut down, it seems to vanish uh, away from, from what we normally think we can deal with in academic methods. And, but the point here is that this is a continuum. There is no a sharp cutoff. There are not two categories where on the one hand you have scientific and on the other hand speculative, but they really blend into one another. And it would be misplaced scientism uh, to insist on a sharp uh, distinction between these two different types of risk. It would also be a mistake to suppose that the scientific ones are even more probable or more serious. Uh, it's a different idea here than probability or severity. So you could have, and indeed it seems to be the case, that uh, the most serious and the most probable risks that humanity is facing um, the most serious global catastrophic risks that humanity is facing are all towards the speculative end. So if we just focused on the scientific ones, the ones that are easy to study with you know, hard scientific methods, we would just blind ourselves to most of the risks that are out there. And this is something to keep in mind also if in a conference like this we come from different disciplines and have different expectations of what kind of analysis counts as good analysis. You would expect more um, from somebody coming um, from a discipline studying a risk at the very scientific end, where you might expect quantitative models based on well corroborated theory. But if you're trying to do things that are further to the right, you will have to accept that the reasoning will be less rigorous and watertight. Um, uh, one, we can introduce the expectation value of a risk, the negative expectation value. This is standardly written as uh, probability times harm. Um, there are various qualifications one can introduce to that. If we write harm as scope times intensity, that is the size of the population times how severely each individual in the population would be damaged, we could get the first formula here. And again, that's not general valid because you might think there are harms that are not simply uh, um, the sum of um, um, effects on each individual. You might have harm to the ecosystem or harm to the pattern of distribution or something like that. But as a first shot, one can write something like that. And this is time indexed. So the probability of a risk is something that can change over time. So these are epistemic probabilities and as we learn more or as we implement countermeasures, the probability can go up or down. <coughs> um, we can then define a risk as a set of um, maximally specific negatively evaluated scenarios coupled with a time index probability. So if we define risks like that, there could be um, scenarios, maximally specific histories of the world, that would fall under many different risks. Um, so there could be a particular scenario that involves, say, um, a, a war, a pandemic, and then that causes a global recession. All of these things could happen. Um, and that specific, maximally specific scenario would then be part, by definition, of these three different risks. So this means that one can't determine the overall probability of risks just by adding up the probability of individual risks. That only works if we define the particular risks in such a way that their scenario classes are disjoint. And so finally, um, just drawing attention to the time profile of different hazards, uh, because this is also something that can cause confusion. I've noticed um, when people are arguing about which risk is biggest, we have to distinguish whether they are arguing about which risk is biggest right now, or which risk will cumulatively pose the greatest threat to global civilization. Um, so for example, right now, the risk from advanced nanotechnology causing a major disaster 
is zero or close to zero because there is no very advanced nanotechnology of the relevant kind. On the other hand, there is a real risk of asteroids. Um, moving farther into the future, however, the relative significance of these different risks uh, will change. Um, and so before we conclude that two people have a firm disagreement about which risk is biggest, we want them to specify what the relevant time frame is that they are looking at. And um, so this is all that I will say by means of introduction.